In sports, a choker is one of the worst things an athlete can be labeled as. One of the reasons the choker label is so hard to get rid of is because there's really no one definition of what choking is. In some instances, it might be a singular game where a team blew a huge lead. 2016 Falcons, anybody? Or it could refer to a singular play where a player had a humongous brain fart at the worst possible moment. What's up, Chris Webber? Or it could mean a team blowing a playoff series lead, like, let's say, a 73-win team blowing a 3-1 lead in the finals? Ha, huh. imagine if that actually happened. Or it could just plain be a player performing well below their usual standard in a playoff series that resulted in their team losing. And you want to know a dirty little secret? Every single great player has choked at some point in their careers. In this particular video, I'm going to focus on the biggest choke jobs by a handful of NBA legends or current great players. Nobody is safe. Starting off with a a blast from the past, Larry Bird, aka Larry Legend, is one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Three-time league MVP and two-time finals MVP, as well as a three-time NBA champion. He was absolutely feared by opponents in clutch situations, but that doesn't mean that he was flawless. An in-depth look at his postseason career shows that Larry Legend had quite a few more playoff disappointments than one might expect. But what was Larry Legend's biggest meltdown, a series where he underperformed so greatly that that it could be argued that he single-handedly cost the Celtics a series. Well, look no further than the 1988 Eastern Conference Finals versus the Detroit Pistons. Statistically, it could be argued that the 1988 season was the best season of Larry Bird's career. He averaged a career high in points and player efficiency rating, and he finished second in MVP voting behind Michael Jordan. The Celtics were fresh off of four straight trips to the NBA Finals, and they barely got back to the Conference Finals after squeaking by the Atlanta Hawks in seven games. But for whatever reason, Larry Bird just didn't have it in this series. Shooting a dreadful 35% from the floor and averaging over 10 points per game fewer than he did in the regular season. All four of the Celtics' losses in the series were down to the wire. And if Larry had played up to his standards that he was known for, then there's no reason to think the Celtics couldn't have beaten the Pistons once again. 1988 was the last deep playoff run the Celtics ever made in the Larry Bird era before his body broke down and made him a shell of the player he once was. And although his legacy is secure in NBA history, this is a series that I'm sure he would like to forget. You can't talk about Larry Bird without also talking about his biggest rival, Magic Johnson. Great porn name, by the way. Magic's greatness on the basketball court is undeniable. A five-time champion, a three-time finals MVP, a three-time league MVP, the all-time leader in assists per game, and by far the all-time leader in postseason assists. It was hard to come up with a decision on what was Magic Johnson's biggest playoff disappointment. After all, in none of the playoff series that he lost in his prime, he never really put up bad numbers. However, there is one particular series in which Magic certainly wasn't at his best in the fourth quarter. And all my diehard NBA fans already know that I'm talking about the 1984 Finals. Magic's per-game averages in the series were still great, but as I said in the intro, there are different kinds of choking. In Magic's case, this is a Chris Webber type of choke where a few bad plays were so bad that it could be argued that they cost his team the series despite his normally good play in the series. I don't know if anybody has ever specifically asked Magic this, but I'm pretty sure that this is the series that he regrets the most in his entire career. And although he would later beat the Celtics and Larry Bird two times in the finals, in the moment, losing to his bitter rival had to have been hell. And the worst part is, he really doesn't have anybody else to blame but himself. But I'm sure Magic doesn't spend too much time I'm sulking about this series. After all, he's a very positive person. Not even the NBA's all-time leading scorer is immune from choking every now and then. While Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's entire career was the personification of greatness, his years with the Milwaukee Bucks were his best statistically. In 1973 was certainly no different. He should have won his third straight MVP, but the voters gave it to Dave Cowens of the Boston Celtics, who won 68 games. Even though by every statistical measure, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar blew Cowens out of the water. But Kareem's outstanding 1973 regular season just makes his 1973 postseason even more puzzling, as he saw a major drop-off in points and efficiency and the Bucks lost in the first round. For a man who was normally excellent in the postseason during his prime, this sticks out like a sore thumb. 
But I'm not sure Kareem is stressing too much about it. After all, he finished his career with six MVPs and six championships. But nevertheless, 1973 is a postseason that Cap would like to forget. Wilt Chamberlain was a prolific scorer both on and off the basketball court. In fact, your grandma probably slept with him at one point or another. But this is a basketball video, not a sex video, so we're going to make it all about Wilt Chamberlain's on-court career. Which, by the way, was pretty fucking good. Wilt's career was very interesting and, in my opinion, can be divided into three different phases. Phase 1 were the first seven years of his career where he put up monumental scoring numbers and won seven straight scoring titles. Phase 2 was 1967 and 1968 playing with the 76ers where he took on less scoring but more of an all-around role, even leading the league in assists in 1968. And the third and final phase of his career when he was older with the Los Angeles Lakers from 1969 to 1970 and purposely didn't look to score as much as he did earlier in his career when he was in his prime. This context is necessary when trying to evaluate which was Wilt's biggest choke job in the postseason. After all, Wilt already has the label of a choker in some circles, even though he does have two rings and a finals MVP on his resume. With all this being said, I decided to go with the 1968 Eastern Conference Finals as Wilt's biggest individual choke job. Why does this get the nod? Well, for a multitude of different reasons. They were to defend champions, Wilt's first ring, they had the best record in the league in 1968, and they had the MVP. Guess who? Wilt, the fourth and final MVP of his career. So when they went up 3-1 on the aging Boston Celtics in the Eastern Divisional Finals, the same Boston Celtics team they had eliminated the year before, everybody assumed that they were going to repeat as champions. But that wasn't the case. Wilt greatly underperformed in the last three games of the series, which was a big reason why the 76ers fell right behind. To make things worse, this would be the last game Wilt would ever play with the 76ers, demanding a trade to the Los Angeles Lakers with Jerry West and Elgin Baylor shortly afterwards. I happen to think Wilt Chamberlain being known as a choker is unfair and lazy, but in this particular case, it was definitely appropriate. Dirk Nowitzki is one of the greatest players of all time, not just for his regular season consistency, but for his tendency to increase his production come playoff time. He's one of the very few players throughout NBA history that actually gets better in terms of production in the postseason without losing any efficiency. But it's safe to say that that wasn't the case in 2007. Any basketball fan remembers the 2007 Western Conference first round series between the Golden State Warriors and the 67 win Dallas Mavericks. Dirk won his first and only league MVP that season, joining the legendary 50-40-90 club along the way. But when it comes to talking about the 2007 season and Dirk Nowitzki, that's where the positives end, because once the postseason came around, it was a nightmare. Against the Warriors, Dirk was, well, he was horrible. His production and efficiency both fell off of a cliff. And for a guy who was fighting those soft European stereotypes, this wasn't his best moment, as he seemed completely disinterested most of the time. All in all, the Mavericks couldn't overcome come Dirk's incredibly subpar play and they bowed out in six games. To this day, it's still seen, rightfully so, as one of the biggest choke jobs by any team in sports history. Nowadays, Dirk is seen as a beloved champion and NBA legend who revolutionized the game with his outside shooting for a seven-footer, but it wasn't all rainbows and sunshine along the way. I just hope Giannis's MVP presentation this year isn't as sad as Dirk's was in 2007. Ugh, such a tough scene. Fresh off of an incredibly impressive, albeit it heavily refated championship in 2006, Dwayne Wade had cemented himself as a superstar. Yet his title defense in 2007 was not easy by any stretch of the imagination, both individually and team-wise. The defending champs limped to a 44 and 38 record, while D Wade himself missed 31 games with a variety of injuries. Yet heading into their 2007 first-round series against the Chicago Bulls, people expected Miami to right the ship. After all, D Wade was a superstar and this was a heavily veteran laden team, but it didn't quite work out that way. D. Wade performed well below his superstar standards and the Heat were swept in the first round, going down as one of the worst title defenses in NBA history. This kicked off a disappointing four-year stretch between Miami's 2006 title and the arrival of LeBron James and Chris Bosh for the Big Three era. The Miami Heat
are one of the most well-run organizations in the entire sport, but say the term 2007 to any Heat fan and they're sure to tremble with disappointment. The most recent addition to this list is oh so sweet for me as a Kawhi Leonard truther. I could go on for hours about how Kawhi Leonard's career is the personification of the right place in the right time, but that's a video for another day. Getting back to the task at hand, the 2020 Los Angeles Clippers will go down as one of the biggest disappointments in NBA history, and the 2020 Conference Semifinals versus Denver will go down probably as Kawhi Leonard's biggest choke job. And while most of the blame and jokes will go to Leonard's teammate, Paul George, aka Way Off P, Leonard himself was absolutely atrocious in the second halves of games in the series, and he had what is most likely the worst game of his career given the circumstances in Game 7, scoring just 14 points on 6 of 22 shooting, including going 1 for 11 in the second half. All year long and all postseason long, really, we had heard about how Kawhi Leonard was overtaking LeBron as the best player in the NBA. But after Leonard's absolutely disgusting performance in this series to blow a 3-1 lead, I think we can put those debates to rest. As of right now, Kawhi Leonard is just a glorified Luel Dang with social anxiety. Although, to be fair to Dang, he does have more career points than Jeff Green and Gordon Hayward, unlike Kawhi. Looks like it wasn't your city after all, bitch. It was pretty easy to choose the biggest choke job of Steph Curry's career, not just because it's the biggest choke job for him, but it's arguably the biggest choke job in sports history. Anytime your team breaks the single season regular season wins mark and then goes up 3-1 in the finals just to end up losing, that's a historic choke. I've already gone over Steph Curry's 2016 finals performance in depth in my other video, but who am I kidding? I just love talking about the 2016 finals and the Warriors collapse. After having one of the greatest regular seasons in NBA history, Steph Curry badly underperformed, to put it lightly, in the 2016 finals. And as much as Warriors fans and Steph's cult fan base try to make excuses for him, the biggest reason the Warriors lost was because Steph greatly underperformed. The stats don't lie, and the film certainly doesn't lie either. I mean, just look at some of these misses. Absolutely disgusting. It's no wonder after this series, Steph and the other Warriors went twerking in the Hamptons to Kevin Durant, begging him to join their already formidable team like a bunch of dogs. And speaking of Kevin Durant, the Warriors weren't the only team to blow a 3-1 lead in the 2016 playoff. In fact, they themselves came back from a 3-1 deficit the very round before the finals against the OKC Thunder. The Thunder, who were led by Kevin Durant, looked poised to make their second finals appearance in five years, jumping out on the Warriors and completely dismantling them in games three and four to take a 3-1 lead. The Thunder now had three chances to win one more game to get back to the finals, and they couldn't do it. Durant did put up 40 points in the Thunder's game five loss, but he shot just 12 for 31 from the floor, including three of 10 in the fourth quarter, and his impact wasn't nearly as much as his stats would indicate. But hey, you lost a game on the road to a 73-win team, and you're going home for game six. It's not the end of the world, right? Well, it kind of is if you're an OKC fan, because in game six, Durant had one of the worst performances of his career on a big stage, shooting 10 for 31, including one of seven in the fourth quarter. Despite this, the Thunder most likely would have won if not for a historic performance by Klay Thompson. It was obvious to anybody with two working eyes after the game that the Thunder were completely deflated, what's up Tom Brady, and that game seven was going to be a nightmare for them. And that's what it was. Durant took just 10 shots through the first three quarters of game seven before making a few late jumpers when the game was already out of reach to pad his stats. During his entire run with OKC, Durant had Russell Westbrook to lean on as a scapegoat. He constantly got passes from the media for underperforming in the playoffs, and he basically had it made as well as any superstar could. But all the excuses in the world don't change the fact that Durant shot a horrible 28.9% from the floor in the fourth quarter of the 2016 Conference Finals. I don't think anybody would have blamed Durant for leaving OKC because of Westbrook, but the fact that he went to join Golden State, the team that he choked a 3-1 lead to, is still repulsive to this day. OKC was more than good enough to win the title. After all, they just got done dismantling a 67-win Spurs team in the conference semifinals and had a 3-1 lead on the 73-win Warriors. If Durant played up to his usual standard, 
standards, they definitely would have gone to the finals. But instead, he decided to sabotage his own legacy and take the easiest road possible. When it comes to sports, athletes usually get criticism the more they lose, but in Durant's case, he got more criticism the more he won. No amount of burner accounts or Twitter rampages will ever change the fact that Durant ruined the NBA for three years because of his own cowardice and beta male tendencies. Real ones will never forget his 2016 choke job. One of the few holes in Tim Duncan's legendary career is that he never won back-to-back -back titles with the Spurs. And although he ended up winning five championships, I'm sure the 2004 season is a missed opportunity he still thinks about. After all, he and the Spurs were up 2-0 on the Los Angeles Lakers in the Western Conference semifinals, and he was performing great, as usual in the postseason, until he wasn't. The Spurs went from having a 2-0 series lead to losing in six games, in part because of Derek Fisher's miraculous shot at the end of Game 5, but also because Duncan woefully underperformed compared to his usual postseason standards in those games. In my opinion, Duncan had a lot more underwhelming postseason performances than people like to admit and he skated by on a lot of criticism that other superstars usually face because he won titles early in his career. There's no questioning his greatness, but I'd like to see people be a little bit more honest about his playoff failures. Did you know that Hakeem Olajuwon lost eight times in the first round? Probably not. But, in defense of Hakeem, most of the times where his team lost in the first round, he was either out of his prime or he put up good numbers and lost. There is one major exception, though. The 1990 Western Conference first round versus is the Los Angeles Lakers. The reason this series sticks out like a sore thumb is because Hakeem Olajuwon is legitimately one of the greatest postseason players of all time. He's one of the very few outliers in the sense that his production increases as well as his efficiency in the postseason. But as I alluded to, that wasn't the case in this series. Although he averaged almost an astounding six blocks per game, every other part of his game decreased from the regular season. Most notably, his scoring output and efficiency, a complete 180 from most of his postseason career. Hakeem is one of the most skilled and beloved NBA players of all time. But in this particular series, the dream was a nightmare. Believe it or not, there was once a time when Shaquille O'Neal was seen as a postseason underachiever. After seven seasons in the league, he still had zero rings, and five of his six playoff series losses were sweeps. But it's the one playoff series loss in that span where he wasn't swept that goes down as his most disappointing performance. The 1997 Western Conference semifinals versus the Utah Jazz. When the Lakers acquired Shaq from the Orlando Magic in free agency that offseason, the title expectations were through the roof. But the self-proclaimed most dominant player ever went out with a whimper, seeing significant drops in both production and efficiency in the series. Shaq would later prove himself in the postseason with three straight dominant finals performances spearheading a Lakers three-peat. But in this 1997 series versus the Jazz, the Big Diesel played like the Big weasel. Before forcing his way to Boston in 2007, Kevin Garnett didn't see much postseason success with the Minnesota Timberwolves. In his first 12 seasons with Minnesota, the Timberwolves won just two playoff series, both coming in 2004 when they made the Western Conference Finals. It would be foolish to blame Minnesota's playoff failures on Garnett, though, considering he was the only consistently good thing that they had. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that his postseason performance was always flawless. Take the 2000 Western Conference first round series versus Portland, for example. Other than the assist per game category, Garnett's production was seriously lacking both on a per game basis and efficiency wise. To put the cherry on top of the shit Sunday, Garnett closed out the series with a dreadful 5 for 20 shooting performance at home. I really hope that the big ticket gave himself a ticket for this dreadful performance. Trying to pick James Harden's biggest postseason choke job is a monumental task because there are so many. In the end, I decided to go with the 2017 Western Conference semifinals versus the San Antonio Spurs. The reason this one sticks out to me amongst all the other chokes is because James Harden had everything set up perfectly for him to succeed in this series, and yet he still came up short both in the fourth quarter and overtime, most notably in Game 5 when he was blocked by a balding Manu Ginobili as time expired. We could even go back to Game 2 of the series when Harden put up a 3 for 17 clunker, but no. The reason this this series takes the crown for Harden's biggest choke job is because of his Game 6 performance against a Kawhi-less Spurs team at home. Harden's performance in this game was so atrocious and so lackluster that even his biggest fans, and we all know how obnoxious Rockets fans can be, don't defend him for it. I don't
don't like to play armchair psychologist when it comes to athletes, but it's obvious at this point with the repeated postseason failures that Harden is missing something intangibly. 2004 was a difficult year for the late NBA legend Kobe Bryant, both on and off the court. Going into the 2004 season, the Lakers, despite all of the feuding by Kobe and Shaq, were still picked to win the championship after adding Karl Malone and Gary Payton in free agency. Despite all the off-court bullshit, the Lakers finished with 56 wins and the number two seed in the Western Conference. They went on to win the Western Conference and played the upcoming Detroit Pistons in the 2004 Finals. Despite universal acknowledgement that the Pistons' defense was legit, there was no real reason to think that they would be able to beat the Los Angeles Lakers, who had won three of the last four championships. But the Pistons not only beat the Lakers, they pretty much kicked their ass, winning the series in five games and coming within one Kobe Bryant clutch shot in game two of sweeping. But let's get real here. The reason why the Lakers lost this series falls solely on Kobe Bryant's shoulders. He was absolutely horrendous outside of game two. There's really not much more to say than that. The stats show it. The eye test showed it. It was an extremely disappointing end to one of the most successful eras in Lakers history. It's no secret that Kobe emulated and looked up to Michael Jordan, and if he had played much better than he did in 2004, he might have been able to equal MJ's six rings. Not that it really matters anyway. I mean, Jesus, the guy still has five rings. That's still really fucking good, you know what I mean? Rest in peace, Kobe and Gianna Bryant. Michael Jordan was so amazing at playing basketball that he never really had a bad playoff series. So trying to figure out what was his biggest choke job was difficult. There was obviously the 1995 series against the Orlando Magic where he had a late turnover and went cold late in game six to lose the series, but people always talk about, oh, well, there's an asterisk next to that because he was coming back from baseball. But what about a year where he wasn't coming back from baseball and lost? Those did happen too, by the way. As stated earlier, no team ever completely shut down Michael Jordan, but the Detroit Pistons came about as close as you possibly could to taking him out of his comfort zone. And the 1989 Eastern Conference Finals is the best example of this. It's hard to believe now, but Michael Jordan's Bulls weren't always the top juggernauts in the NBA. At this point in his career, Jordan's Bulls were still trying to overcome the Pistons, who were the top team in the East. The underdog Bulls ended up taking a 2-1 series lead through three games against the favored Pistons, led by an amazing 46-point performance by Jordan in Game 3. But Game 3 was the only game of the series where Jordan really played like Jordan, and his performances in Games 4 and 5 are why the 89 Conference Finals is his biggest choke job in my opinion. Game 4 saw Jordan shoot 5 for 15 and being held to 23 points in a blowout home loss. But Jordan's performance in Game 5 of the series remains his most perplexing performance. In 46 minutes, Jordan took just 8 shot attempts and finished with 18 points. He was outscored by his own teammate Craig Hodges, and the Bulls lost the game to fall down 3-2 in the series. It's no surprise that Jordan's Last Dance documentary failed to mention this, as Jordan is still probably embarrassed by it. Facing elimination in Game 6, Jordan played better, putting up 32 points and 13 assists, but he shot a horrid 5 of 12 from the free throw line and committed 8 turnovers. The reason why Jordan is at worst one of the two best basketball players ever is because even his biggest choke job was still better than most players are on their best days. So the next time you hear somebody say Jordan would have done this or Jordan would have done that to degrade a current player, just remember that Jordan himself underachieved in the playoffs before too. After all, nobody is perfect. When you're talking about the biggest chokes in NBA history on the court, it's hard to get any worse than LeBron James in the 2011 finals. As a huge LeBron fan, it pains me to do this segment, but it must be done. It wasn't just the fact that LeBron so badly underperformed compared to his usual standard, it was how he did it. He was already public enemy number one before the series for ditching Cleveland to go join Miami with his friends Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. So many people were desperately rooting to see him fail, and he didn't disappoint them. LeBron has been criticized for a lot of wrong reasons throughout his career, and he's been blamed for a lot of losses that weren't his fault, but there is no doubt about where the blame lies here. Out of his six finals losses, this is the only one that can't be explained away. You couldn't blame him for losing because his teammates were underwhelming like you could in 2007, 2015, and 2018, or that his finals opponent just went supernova and was unbeatable like the 2014 Spurs and the 2017 Warriors. No. This was a series where if LeBron had played anywhere close to his normal ability, the Heat probably would have won this series in four 
four or five games. The most incredible part is that despite LeBron playing like a poor man's Gerald Wallace, the Heat were this close to sweeping the Mavericks. The Heat won game one in which LeBron had his only good game of the series. They ended up blowing a 15 point lead in the fourth quarter of game two that would have put them up 2-0. They squeaked out a 88-86 win in game three to go up 2-1 and they blew another late fourth quarter lead in game four, a game in which LeBron James scored eight points. Eight points, that's it, just eight. And his team lost by just three points. A career 27 point per game scorer put up just eight points. There's no excuse for it and it's unacceptable. LeBron was absolutely abysmal in the fourth quarter all series long and that was a big reason why the Heat fell in six games. And LeBron became the butt of every joke in America. A super talented choker who had no ring. But by now in 2020 that's ancient history as LeBron has made seven more finals since and won three championships to go along with three finals MVPs. Still no matter what LeBron accomplishes for the rest of his career and believe me he's accomplished a lot there is no way to completely scrub out the shit stain that was the 2011 finals on his resume. 